Let's uh, turn in our scripture reading. I asked Mark this morning, I didn't see the one in the bulletin, uh, Matthew 8, but Mark said he'd like Matthew 9. So turn with me in your, your Bibles and we'll read what the scriptures have to tell us. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. How many of you took the opportunity to read what uh, is going to be presented for our small groups? How many of you looked at that today? Uh, if you didn't, you missed the blessing. There's three illustrations in there that I really enjoyed. So Mark, we're looking forward to your presentation. And it's nice to have a retired pastor in our midst. He's ready to jump in and help and we're not gonna let him get that harness off. Testing one, two, we're, we're, we're on. All right, we just had prayer. Good morning, everybody. I'm hoping you're all ready for some questions. Am I up, Ben? This is lesson number nine. We're dealing with the orchestra and the question that we have here for you is the meaning, the meaning of an orchestra means a large group of musicians who play a variety of different instruments together and in what? Harmony. I like the uh, story, if you read that, as far as what they did in an orchestra and how they were having some is issues here, but let me just, we'll catch in there. Question I ask, and this is one that comes an awful lot in the invaded church, is why is there so many empty pews in our church? Now that is probably what most churches are asking. Secondly, why are we losing members to the other local churches? Although we're gaining some, haven't we? Can't go see. Me, we don't know about you guys, the real cults, they came and then you guys moved. Not sure why, maybe family, but some of ours escaped to the other places too. So, all right. How can we be fully activate spiritual gifts in our church? We talk about them, we think we know them, but how do we activate them? How many members become true priests and ministers? Good question, isn't it? And how can our church change? That's what we're talking about. One word that we're dealing with this, in this whole lesson is change for the better. So change is a process with a plan. Jesus himself got to, into disagreements with the Pharisees over the subject of change. Now it's interesting. How old do you think Jesus was, Randy? Good. And how old do you think the Pharisees were? There you go. 
Now, do the older and younger kind of get agree? Do they agree most of the time, or do you think there's changes? Do you like younger people up front, say old people like myself? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just kind of sitting here is Jesus attracting people, and yet the elders kind of put him down. Isn't that right? Kind of interesting thing, but let's take a look at the change. One of the many things they did not like about his minister was the fact that he and his disciples are experiencing too much. Now that's a new one. Now I'm so glad we have elders here, the older guys. Randy, are you there in that group too? Or <laughs> anyway. But it's interesting. I remember in this one church that we went to, the elder was older. And the elder did not like people laughing or clapping in the church in some way. They said the church is time to be sober and sad. So he was like, when the disciples of John came to him and said, how often, why do we and the other Pharisees fast, fast often? But your disciples do not fast. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, he said, and with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces and they may appear to be men fast. Jesus said to them, can the friends of a bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is worse. Nor can one put new wine into old wine skins, or else the wine skin break and the wine spills and the wine skins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wine skins and they both are preserved. In those days, there were what? No one? Bottles. So they just put them in the skins of goats and what would you like, how would you like to drink from that? The new wine eventually gave off gases, began to ferment. I remember going here to camp one time. We had a camp up here. Where is that at, old people? Um, Forest Ridge Camp. And what the guys did, they made hooch. You ever heard of hooch? Just kind of a mixture of things. And they were fermented. But... Uh, now, if they kept the new wine, the old dried up and the fix and become inflexible wine skin, the gases burst the skin, both containers in the wine will be. Now, Jesus says something profound about how to renew our church. He describes two kinds of renewal. One is the wine, he says, is the new thinking and new ideas. Do you think we need new thinking and new ideas here? What do you all think? It represents personal renewal within our minds and hearts. By personal, it deals primarily with the church members as individuals. The second type renewal of the wine is the wineskin is the organizational structure. It has to do how we organize ourselves in the local church and how we live out the new wine principles in the Bible. So we have to have new ideas and put them in operation. The new wine of Jesus' teaching could not fit into the old Jewish system. So the soon, soon the temple, the animal sacrifices, and Levitical priesthood would all pass away and be replaced by new wineskins and organization of the New Testament church. The point is that unless we renew both our ideas and the way we live them out in the church, renewal will be short-lived. It is a fallacy to think that we can efficiently renew the church by simply renewing individuals within it. What do you think of that? Mark, the old adage is uh, back then with the Pharisees, but uh, Jesus was trying to introduce something new. Oh, we can do something better. Yes. Because it was old. Uh, renewing it. So that's not the way we're used to doing it. Did you all hear that? Good. Yes, that's a good thing. And imagine an elder who's older would say that. It's not how we did things around here. It's, not, it's good. 
We may also remodel those individuals. We must also remodel the way those individuals function collectively as a, as a organization. New truths cannot flourish unless in a business as usual atmosphere. What significant, so here's where we come, what significant changes have occurred in the way the church functioned during the past five years? And the second one behind it is, tell us how, about how the church relates to this change. So let me back up. What do you think? Or who can I pick? Only, only Bob, Nathan, can you tell me what do you think? Is there any positive changes that you've seen in the past five years? It's hard for me to say much because I've been gone at college the last couple of years. But I, I do believe that I've seen the church grow over the time that I've been gone. And it could be a thing in communal and foundation dynamics. I believe would say that we're able to fit, fit the church under the, our ministry under others and that we would have a command. So. Okay. Anybody else want to put their few words in? They're so quiet back here. What do you think? Jessica. When you came to this church, did you see some changes or you seen good things? I put you on the spot. I know you're a thinker. I may come to Sarah too. Are you ready, Sarah? I don't think I'll need this, but our, <laughs> I guess I don't have much to say. I'm just trying to think of significant positive changes. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't really mentally here the first year of our attendance because we were building our house. I was pretty distracted and just absorbed into all the craziness of my own life. And then, I mean, COVID has hit. So yeah, it's, I guess it's hard to see. And I wasn't, I mean, obviously around the previous three years. So I'm not sure. I mean, it's been good since, you know, I've noticed, you know, past Rodney's come and I feel like there's, um, you know, people are really excited about that. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I honestly good. have nothing to say. Right. <laughs> yes. Back in the corner. I will say with COVID, I think that's something that a lot of people have addressed with quite a bit because it's given us the new ability to reach out to other people in the platforms online that maybe previously we hadn't done in such a extent. Yes. That's good. Excellent. Good insights. I like young people's insights. Don't you? Anybody? Yes, in the corner over here, Amanda. So Brian and I actually left this church a couple of years ago to go minister in Boone, but um, we've been attending here since November. And since leaving and coming back, um, Pathfinders has bloomed. I mean, that's been huge for the church is the focus on the kids. Um, so I just have really appreciated seeing how active they are now. Yes. Aren't you glad for a church school? I mean, that is a, that's a blessing in itself too. There's not very many church schools. I can remember when I started a ministry and come to Iowa back in 91 and the number of church schools there were, and now it just keeps like shrinking, but Nevada's hanging in there, which is good. All right. Anybody else? Sarah. Yes. As I, uh, as I read in the scriptures, and this is not uh, any change that's come about, but as I read with the children of Israel, there were those faithful people that prayed all the years that they were in captivity, kept wanting a deliverer to come and rescue them. And all through the Old Testament, you see that. But there was those faithful people that kept honoring God and were that's, faithful to him. They good. didn't bend to the idol worship that was so uh, prevalent back in that time. And I, I see that in our church. I see 
the faithful members who are consistently uh, trying to do what God is leading them to do. Their right. faithfulness in in every aspect of our church life. And, That's and I'm so thankful for that. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Sarah. Well, I, I also have a bit of a unique case, kind of like Jessica was talking about. Um, we got here in 2018, and then we spent pretty much a whole year sick. <laughs> Um, so we weren't here a whole lot the first year, but I can tell you that the, the changes that I have seen since we came, um, anytime a church operates without a pastor, it kind of forces them to sink or swim. Mm -hmm. Are you going to work together? Or are you going to fall apart? And what I've seen is that the church has grown stronger together um leading up to the time that pastor rodney came um and i say you guys because i felt like i wasn't part of it for for kind of that growing part but you guys did come together you did figure things out without a pastor and that says a lot to a congregation i think yeah um but then also you know what was already said is that the the way that ben has stepped up and really gotten zoom to work for people who weren't coming really helped me i i don't know where i would be mentally or spiritually if i hadn't had access to zoom on sabbath mornings you know maybe i would have found some church service somewhere online but to have the consistency with my own church family was really important for this last year so um i think there's been some very positive changes and technology and just interpersonal growth within the church. Sarah, just to continue this, just hold your, hold your, hold your horses there. You've been with me to several churches. You kept following me or oh, you followed, you followed, yeah, you followed me. Like that. Think, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, when you compare this church to the three other churches that we've been together in as families, our families together, yeah. how would you compare to this church? This church is a lot more accepting a lot more inclusive um one thing i appreciated when we first got here is we were kind of navigating the whole sending kids to daycare and nathan starting school and me working remotely um we were not quite ready to fully immerse ourselves in church and you guys were very respectful of that when we came you weren't you know, knocking down our door saying, oh, we really need you to fill these five church positions, even though, you know, it's just two adults. <laughs> um, we need you to do this, this, and this, and be here all the time. And like you, were, you respected our personal growth within the church, um, but you were also very willing to accept whatever we had to offer too. So it wasn't that you pushed us away. It wasn't that you like clung on to us too much, but you were just the appropriate amount of friendly and loving and welcoming. Um, other churches that I've been to have been a bit more clingy at first. You walk in the door and the first thing they say is, oh good, our piano player is here. And that's, you know, at, at times that's a nice thing, but other times it just feels like a burden, you know? Um, I don't know. I, I guess this church is different from the other churches that I've been to. And it's just, I think mostly the interpersonal interactions with people. That says something, isn't it, to you folks? You don't know the other churches. We've been there. I, I, I know exactly what they're like because I've been there. But, and I want to just say something else that I'm surprised. Are you surprised about Ben and even uh, Brian helping out the PA, you like those? I think those, that's an excellent thing. It's behind the, get, behind the scenes, but it's necessary, isn't it? We'll talk about those coming up. Anybody else? Yes, yes, Jennifer. I guess as someone in ministry, I have like a different viewpoint, I guess. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just because, well, I think I was trying to figure out, I've been here about four years, so I haven't been here the whole five. And I feel like it's been a roller coaster kind of in some ways. 
Interesting. Okay, um, go ahead. Like I feel when I first got here, like some of the smaller ministries were pretty strong and they've kind of like gone down like women's ministries. And I think there's some ministries that are pretty consistent, um, like some of the outreach ministries, like Food at First and stuff like that. Um, but some of our other ministries, I feel like have kind of fallen by the side. And then also, like, I feel like the kids ministries have gotten stronger with the Pathfinders being back up and going in. Um, people being interested in helping with that and stuff. So I feel like I'm mixed. Um, I feel like if I will be completely honest, hard on sleeve moment, if you have kids or grandkids, um, I feel like it is way more inclusive. Um, if you're not in that category, I feel like sometimes you get left by the side. And that's just me being honest in hard that's on good. sleeve moment. One should be honest. Yeah. Need, need to be honest. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Anybody else? Okay, gonna add another question to you to you. How does what does this tell us about how our church relates to change? Valerie, you want to say something? Oh, okay. <laughs> Come to say something random. I'm good. I'm good. What do you think? Does the church relate to change? All right, Jeff, our elder, first. Elder. In this last year, we've had a lot of challenges with COVID. On, are we going to have church? Are we not going to have church? Are we going to segregate? Are we going to wear masks? And I think we've come through it pretty well. I know we've got some people who still aren't comfortable, and that's okay. But I think as a whole, the church body has come together and, and so much wanted to come together and worship together that that says a lot about our members that we really clay, uh, crave that fellowship that we yeah. get here. Good, thank you. Anybody else on that change? Well, thanks for both of you ladies' honesty. I think that was good. And that was, thank you too, Jeff. Yes, Shannon. Um, I'm not sure how long we've been coming to church here, but um, we, shortly after we came, you guys attempted a move to the Ames building. And so we tried that for a while and then we ended up moving back here. And I guess what I've observed is I feel like everyone really works together. If there's an opportunity, people are willing to try it. And if they decide it doesn't work, everyone seems to be fairly in unison about what does work and what doesn't work. And then they all work together to keep moving forward, whichever way it ends up being. So I've really felt like, I don't feel like there's a lot of division. <clears throat> In the church, it feels like everyone kind of works together. And if there are interpersonal issues, people put those to the side to do what's best for the church. Interesting. Thank you for that comment. Thank you. Anybody else on that? All right, I'm going to move forward. Moses found organization renewal vital to the success when God called him to pastor the weak and imperfect church of Israel. That'd be a pretty tough one to pastor, wouldn't it? He preached earnestly about how God's new wine and labored intensely. But as the people came to him day after day with their complaints, he grew up untight and frustrated. He felt overwhelmed and found himself on this fast track to burnout. Work harder did not make the church better. The solution, God spoke through Jethro, his father-in-law to bring Moses' strategy into balance. In effect, Jethro says, Moses, you've got to pay attention to the wineskins. Examine how you organize things. I want you to develop leaders over thousands and leaders over fifties and hundreds, leaders. Many pastors today face the same problem as Moses did centuries ago. And you can see him about 
all the stuff he has to do and you expect the pastor to do it. Does the church burden the pastor down? What do you think? Does the church expect too much out of Pastor Rodney? Brian, do some churches expect too much out of us? Do many churches expect when you or you were pastored and where I pastored before, because I pastored 22 churches, did they expect, they, did a lot of people expect a lot of things out of you? Did they? Yes. And what did they do? What did they expect? Did you do everything for them or what did they expect from them? Kind of, kind of put me on the spot here, Mark. I know I did. Um, Yes, some, sometimes they expect the pastor to do everything. Good. Pastors are getting paid. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> well I've heard that before, yeah. haven't we? You know, which church I've been in, it's a 10 year ass. That was an elder that said that, and then another elder said the same thing. What does that mean? What do you think Don means, or Glenn means there? Sorry, Glenn. What do you think Glenn means by that? I'm going to sneak one out of Jessica. Well, Jessica, with your husband being in a place where he dissolves fights, supposedly. What do you think? About what? Pastors. Do you think pastors are doing too much? They should be doing too much? Yeah. Do you think people expect them to do more? I'm sure the expectations are there. I mean, everyone has expectations. My husband is very good about boundaries. He is. So, what does it mean, boundaries? Speak. I mean, he's just good at setting boundaries. So, I mean, he, he is, whenever he's gone into a church, he's met with the board and, and the church, and um, he's met with the board of the church, the leadership, and, you know, what do you guys, you know, what do you guys see the, the pastor doing? And then they have a conversation. And, and so then he says, well, you know, this is what I see God has called me to do here. In this situation so he sets boundaries so the expectations are clear as to you know this is my role this is your role um i agree with glenn you know they're they're paid so yeah they're going to be doing more than you know i'm going to be doing as just a, a church member because that's their role as the shepherd of the flock but does that mean that that exempts me from doing something absolutely not does that mean that they have that you know they need to take my job because they're getting paid well no it's not, but yeah, I would say that for the majority, they're probably going to be doing more than a normal person, but we have seen a lot of members that go far above and beyond any pastor that I have ever seen work and, um, you know, winning souls for Christ. So I don't think that it's just like a blanket statement. I think Good. that it's situational. Thank you very much. All right. Yes, Sarah. Start all over, Sarah. Okay. Said, said it. What would it look like to you as a as a former pastor or to any other pastor? What does it look like to have too much expected of them? And I guess maybe that kind of goes back to what Jessica was saying of laying out the expectations. You know, what I don't know. I, at work, I can look up job descriptions and I can see exactly what people are supposed to be doing and it feels like when a new pastor comes in um we just look at them and we say yay it's a pastor and maybe we don't have a clear understanding of everything the pastor is supposed to do or everything that we're supposed to do as church members supporting the pastor we will talk about that just real shortly i have to kind of guard my we're kind of running over but I think that's a good question, but you know, when I come into church, I look and see what God is doing in the church. That's what I do the first thing. And I say, and I'm, I'm what I'm referred to as a talent finder. I look for talents of how God would, could put them to use for God's glory for his church to grow. That's what I see. Because I'm just, I'm just kind of an, the conductor orchestrating the whole church. And it's not my job to tell you what I think you should do. 
My job is to know what God wants you to do. And your job is to connect with God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And what talents have you given me? That's what I would say. I'm a talent finder. Does that make sense? Yeah. In fact, if there's a fight in the church, what I like to do, I told you before what I did. I bring the elders and I say, elders, you take care of it. And I hide behind the elders and let them fight it out. <laughs> but too often pastors are kind of problem solvers, but I don't like solving problems. I like to make the church work together in unison. You've seen that, haven't you, Sarah? I think we tried. Some churches didn't work so well because of the leadership. All right. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. I've been an elder for many years um, and a head elder in several churches. And so I've had experience with several pastors. And some pastors are, like you said, they try and do everything. If there's a conflict, they jump right in and try and settle it. And there have been times where I could go for weeks and not talk to the pastor, except at a church situation. And I can, Patty can attest to this, I talk to Rodney two, three times a week. He's not one that is going to try and solve everybody's problems. He will try and get people together. He will, he leans on his elders and people to try and get things taken care of. So I'm really impressed with the with Rodney's attitude and the way he's trying to um, work through conflicts. And he had some pretty hard conflicts where we had a church that was pretty divided on masks. And I think he worked through that very well. And mm -hmm. he's, he's a communicator. And um, I'm just really impressed with the pastor we now have. Good. God has been good to this church. All right. Well, let me just go through this. This is some of the symptoms churches may have, but I'm, you know, members get tired doing all the work, losing financial troubles. All right. God has called his church and needs to operate. I'm just going to go beyond this. The members of the church are to be and the pastor, conductor, et cetera. How to be effective. Everyone, everyone needs to share a clean, clear, common vision, what they want to want the orchestra to be. The conductor needs to focus primarily on pulling the, together the overall strategy, equipping leaders with the with with the I should say with the other leaders within the section of the orchestra to put it, put each section together. The musicians who understand best how not to be orchestras should not should be mentored. Those who do not orchestra orchestra members should be interviewed, listened to, assessed to see if they are. And I'm just going to go beyond this because we got time with it. Let me back up one here. Uh, we already talked about changes. Here's an interesting one. The head of the church is who? Jesus. The speaking gifts, I would put them in, the, in one other role here, is like the mouth of it. What is the mouth to do? They're apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's the leaders of your church. But also leaders are encouragers, those that have knowledge, tongues, interpreting tongues, and wisdom. Don't you think those are good leadership, encouraging? I think that's a good one. And knowledge and wisdom. The quiet ones. Are quiet people needed? Exactly. Administration, the sterning of spirits, faith, healing, giving, and healing. Those are administrators. Those are quiet ones. What's the difference between an administrator and let's say an, uh, a church leader? What's that administrator? What's their basic talent? Anyone know? Organizing, exactly. They're behind the scenes, but they're good. And I tell you, one of the best organizers we ever had as a pastor was Chris Dorincamp. She, she just was behind the scenes, she was an elder, but she was behind the scenes. She really didn't say a whole lot, but she had it organized. If I had a fantastic meetings or any kind of meeting, she would just plan it all. She'd have a sheet here and she'd tell you exactly what needs to be done. And we, she, she'd ask for input. Discerning of spirits, giving, faith, healing. 
hospitalities, helps. These are the feet, intercessor, session, mercy, miracles, and serving. You think these last people are needed? See, if you didn't have these people, where would the church move? All right. So assimilation, I'm going to finish this up real quick. It talks about two things we need to have to assimilate the members and place them in the right place. At least a third of those who join our church eventually stop coming. What do you think of that? How many missing members do we have? How many members do we have on this book now? Anyone know? I don't know the statistics. How many would you say? A hundred? What do you say, Glenn? How many people do you think are on the books? 80? How many think of those 80 are attending actively? What would you say, Randy? Out of the 80 we have, how many actively are attending? 50? About half, about 40? Okay. Too many who remain never really feel connected to those around them. Anyone felt like that? Interesting, okay. They do not become assimilated to the church life. How is it for people of our church, especially new people, develop a sense of belonging? How easy it is, okay. Now notice this one. Talks about the two circles, right? The membership circle and the fellowship circle. If you were to place an X on this board, where would you put your X at? Would you say you're outside the church, even though you're a member of the church? Would you say you're in the membership circle, but you're not in the fellowship circle? Or would you say you're in the fellowship circle? Which color would you be in? Would you be in the X? The red one, the pink one, or the green one? They're all quiet. Where would you be at? All right, no one wants to say. I'll move on. I know you've been sitting there. People inside the fellowship circle almost feel always underestimate, almost always underestimate the number of members who feel they are not. So if you're in the circle, fellowship circle, you don't really know a lot of people. They also underestimate how difficult it is to get into the fellowship group. Ever been there? Done that? The best way to get people inside the fellowship circle is through what? Friendships. How many develop good friendships in this church? All right, you're all smiling, but I just want you to think about this. Every member who is mentally and spiritually moving closer, every member is mentally, spiritually moving closer to the center or closer to the outside. The ideal is for membership Fellowship circles to be the same size as the membership circle. The two circles won't come closer unless you intentionally organize to make it happen. Makes us think, doesn't it? In the placement process, this is I'm going to end right here. I've got about three more slides. The church takes time to help the members understand God's vision for the church. The members is interviewed, given each personal assessment to discover their gifts, talents, and areas of interest. Based on the interview, the results, they put them to experience. They put them into, and they let them experiment and was carefully are guided and mentored until they find their niche. They will receive help ongoing to be successful. They also receive feedback, loving feedback, notice a lot of encouragement throughout the entire year. Question. If I would join this church, and we don't have time to answer this, what could you guarantee would happen in the next six months to make sure that I felt properly assimilated? Good question. Here's what we're, the goal is. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Took a little longer, but thank you for your input. 